This morning, if you will, open your Bible with me to Matthew 27 to begin with. Matthew chapter 27. The title of my message is Christ's Dying Words on the Cross. Christ's Dying Words on Calvary. These verses that I, we're going to read definitely are not the order in which he was speaking from the cross, but the words we will share some th things uh, with you. Hopefully it will be a blessing to you to know what a great and wonderful Lord you have. He's, he's on that cross. He showed his compassion, and he showed his authority and his love all on the old rugged cross that we sing about. Uh, he just, uh, some things to show that you really have it good to know him. And if you do not know him, you need to know him. He is the one that, that you must know to get to heaven, but he's the one that can bring true joy and satisfaction uh, in your life while you're here on the, this old planet Earth and, and uh, having to uh, endure the hardships that go with the life of living here. What a great God we have in giving us his only begotten son to die on Calvary's cross for our sins. I'll read only one verse there, and you, then you will be turning to Luke 23rd chapter. In verse 46, he says, it says, In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama, excuse me, lama stabay. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Luke chapter 23, and verse 34, Then said Jesus, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his garments and cast lots. In verse 43, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say it unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Talking to one of the thieves on the cross. In verse 46, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now turn to John chapter 19, if you will. And we read verse 26 through 30. These are words that you were just spotting, picking different verses where it shows what he said on the cross at Calvary. You know, we talk about the life of Christ. He was never idle. He was always teaching wherever he was. He was. If he was walking along the road, if he was sitting in a house, it did not matter if he was eating. He was always teaching. He didn't waste his time. And here in John 19, verse 26, and when Jesus there, therefore saw his mother, she, he's on the cross, remember, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. In the verse 34 that we read in Luke, uh, as I reread it with you, it shows the compassion that he had. He was always moved with compassion. He's touched by the feelings of all of our infirmities. You're not going through anything that he's not touched by, that he's not uh, feeling the feelings, and even maybe more so than you. When you're 
touched and when you're hurting and you're weeping, he's touched by those things. The very reason not just to die on Calvary's cross for our sins, but the reason, one of the reasons why he was put in flesh like as we are, that he might know, uh, that you might know that he knows exactly how you're, you feel and what you're going through. In verse 34, again, it said, Then Jesus, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. On the cross at Calvary, dying for the sins of the world, for your sin, for my sin, and the very men that was crucifying him. And he's calling out to the Father in heaven, Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If they would have known what they were doing, they would not have crucified him. If they would have known he was the Lord of glory, they would not have driven, driven those spikes in his hand and feet. They would not have put him on that old rugged cross. But scripture is being fulfilled as it's uh, Old Testament tells about how he would come and how he would be born and how he would live his life and, and go through all the things that he would go through and then, and then lay down his life for your sins and mine. And then to see him with all the brutality that went with crucifying him, having nothing against them. They don't know what they're doing. And I can tell you that's a fact with most all of us. When we're angry, when we're doing something we shouldn't be doing, we really don't know what we're doing. We're beside ourselves, so to speak, at the moment. And we don't know what we're doing or we wouldn't do it. If we only knew what we were doing and what the results is going to be, we would stop. And we'd stop in horror of what we're about to face. But Jesus said, they don't, they don't know. Forgive them, Father. And then they see his authority in verse 43. When, he, when the two thieves, one on either side, uh, one cursing him, one denying him, one dying without him, and the other one saying, Lord, remember me when you come into your paradise. Jesus said, today, not next year, not when you go into some man-made thought of what it might be like after death, but today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The very authority Christ had was to forgive that man immediately and declare to him, today you will be with me. When we pass from this life, you will be with me in, in paradise. You know, Paul even said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's an instant thing. The moment that a man or a woman or a person draws their last breath, a Christian, they enter into the very presence of, of God in heaven. Wherever Jesus is, that's where we will be. And the Bible declares that he's seated on the right hand of the throne of the Father in heaven. So we will be with him. Our, our relatives, our friends, those who have died and gone on, they admit the very moment, that they left out of that old body, they went right into the very presence of Almighty God. And that's a wonderful thought to know, you know, that it, to enter in heaven is we're going to get to be with Jesus. We see his love. He's uttering words of true love on that old rugged cross. I listen to a lot of country western songs, and I, a lot of them says, I'll love you forever. And forever I'll be with you, and forever this. And next thing you know, those same same songwriters are divorcing the, their very mates. Forever, to, and one song says, "How long is forever this time?" Forever is not forever in the minds of man, but with God, forever is forever, no end to it. And and he's going out into eternity with his Father, back to where he come from. In John 19, verse 26. And seven, as he's hanging there on that old rugged cross with all those nails, spikes in his hands and his feet, 
and he's, he's looking down the cross and it says, when Jesus therefore saw his mother. Isn't that a wonderful word? Mother. I, can, I think I mentioned this to you, but I know I did to some of you anyway. I ran away from home. I was gone six weeks. I miss my mother more than I miss my own self, I think. <laughs> Anything about me, I just miss my mother. And I couldn't, I, I didn't think I'd ever go back. But I got a letter from my mother. And I told my friend, I said, they owe me, I think it was $56. You can have it. Just take me to the bus station. I'm going to see my mother. Nothing like a mother. If you'll notice these football players, all these uh, athletes that they mentioned, they always say something about their mom or their mother. Nothing like a wonderful mother. Most wonderful thing on earth for us. And I can tell you this. You have yours, you need to respect and love her while you have her. They will come. She won't be with you. She won't be there to console you and help you and, enter and just make you feel comfortable in your hour of hurt and pain. Jesus is on the cross, and he saw his mom, and the disciple that's standing by him was John. And he said, and to the mother pointing to John behold this is your son now and then he looks at John and he said behold your mother this is your mother in other words you take care of my mother from that hour that disciple took her into his own home and his love for his mother you know I think I said to you his uh, you can read it and find it out for your own sake. Women didn't have a, any means of support back in the days of Jesus. Very few of them worked. And they were dependent upon their, their husband. And if they didn't, their husband's dead, then they depended on their son. And now the, Jesus is saying, I want my mother taken care of. And you're her son now, and you're responsible. I'm giving you the responsibility of making sure she's taking care of the rest of her life. And so John takes him uh, at his word, takes him to home and takes care of her. But he, to show his love and trust for John, he picks John. He's always talking about the one whom Jesus loved. You ever notice that? Jesus loves all of us. So I don't know why it's stated that way, except that John was seemed like always right next to him, just leaning on him and depending on him and trusting him and, and, and the others would say well John you tell him this like John's closer that's kind of like you are isn't it Brother Roll would you just pray for this issue when you know that you have the same open door to heaven as I do and I'll be glad to join you always am and this, I read about this little girl losing all these family I just couldn't help but weep for her loss and her hurts and her pain in talking to God about her and I don't know if I've ever quit for very many moments to tell God this let me know a little more about her and a little bit more if I could be of help to her myself you know the love that we have for the Lord will spread out through our hearts for others for certain selfishness is of the devil the love of God will be, that shed abroad in your heart, will be manifested by your actions. And then we see vehemence in Matthew 27, 46. <clears throat> he said, in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice. It's twice. I don't know how loud it was, but I'm certain it was heard all over the area of Jerusalem, the city. And he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did he forsake him? You know, Psalms, the 22nd chapter, tells you these words were recorded a thousand years about before Jesus even came to this earth, that he would cry out these words as he would die in Psalm 22. But Psalm 22, 1 and 3 tells you why that he cried out. The answer to the what he cried out. 
God is holy. What does that mean? He means like Habakkuk said, he's of pure eyes than to look on iniquity, to behold iniquity. His only begotten son was dying on that cross, had every sin you have ever committed or will ever commit on his body. He has drank, drank the cup. He's taken whatever dregs of sins of all of mankind in that cup. And the Bible says he bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Now when he's dying as a sinner and he's crying out that, it shows that the Father's turned his back on him because of the purity that he has and cannot look at sin in a favorable manner. And Jesus is dying alone for you and me. And the very cry of these words is the cry of every lost sinner that will wound up in hell because they did not accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior. You know, he's ta in taking place of the sinner as a substitute, he had to bear the, the momentary uh, bereavement of his Father in heaven. Cannot be in the presence of sin. Or otherwise, we would be lost forever. He paid hell for you and for me. Then we see, number five, we see his agony. The words that he cried out on Calvary in John 19, 28. <clears throat> After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be full, said, I thirst. There's... 28 at least known prophecies fulfilled on Calvary's when Jesus is hanging on Calvary's cross. 28. I thirst is one of them found in Psalm 69, 21. The vinegar that they would put on his mouth is found there. This, he said that the scripture might be fulfilled. I thirst. Though he, he wouldn't take anything before this, at the very last, as he's taken all the sins of all of mankind, now he's, he's parched from the suffering, from the pains of paying your hell. Should we take church lightly? Should we take lightly our Christian life? fact that we are saved, we've been saved by God's grace should we just say have a little kind of like a ho-hum attitude toward the Lord my friend if you could just get a little glimpse in your mind of how awful it was for him in paying your hell and mine on that cross it would not keep you from doing what he wants you to do and being where you want you to be and saying what he wants you to say you want to be like him, then you'll have to look at what he was like. And as I requote these statements of his own, he said, I do only those things which I, I see my father do. And I say only those things which I hear my father say. He was a wonderful follower and a great leader. And if you ever want to be a great leader, you're going to have to first be a good follower and say only those things which he says. And do only those things which he did. And then you'll be a good leader also. But so the Genesis, the 22nd chapter. Psalms, the 22nd chapter. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. All are prophecies of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and then on John 19.30, we see the words of redemption. The word redeem means to pay, to buy back, to, to pay for. You, he, you and I are lost. We was created. Adam's created, and we're the offspring of Adam, and we're made by him. And he made us once, but we lost. Now he has to buy us back. And he, we're, our sins have separated us from the love of God, 
which is in Christ Jesus, and now he's paying your debt and mine to get us back and redeeming us. John 19.30 says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Three small words. It is finished. He said he had come to do the work of the Father. The work of the Father and the will of the Father was that he would die on Calvary's cross for your sins and mine. And now he's hanging there on that old rugged cross. And he's finishing, has finished the work. He said, it's complete. All of sin debt has been paid completely in, uh, in full. You know, I said, my dad, I was uh, raised in southeast Oklahoma, and my dad, little country grocery store about two miles from our house, and that man had a little book that, like every person that traded in there that he gave credit to, that little book he'd write down and write down all the items they bought, put it in a drawer, you know, add it up how much it was, if they didn't have the money to pay, and then they would come and pay. And, and for example, one day my dad, my he told me, tell your dad that I need him to pay, pay me. And so I told my dad, my dad gave me the money, and I went back. And he took each one of these little pages out and added them all up, and, uh, handed him the money. But when he put these things all together, he wrote right across the top, Paid in full. Meaning that my dad didn't know anything for that. It's paid up. Jesus said the same words right here. These three words is what we use. Paid in full. Every sin that I have ever committed or shall ever commit is paid in full. It is finished. And that's when he did said that. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. This is where he cried out in a loud voice. And he cried out with agony. And then we see him in chapter 23, verse 46 of Luke. The yearning of his heart. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father... And to thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. The very last act of his consciousness was an expression of beautiful trust in the Father. Who just before that had hidden his face. You know, I don't... I don't think there's ever been an hour as dark as it was at those three hours or shall ever be after on this earth as whenever the Father hid his face or we might say turned his back because he of pure eyes in the behold iniquity and his son is the worst sinner in all the world now because he's got every sin of every man on his body. Just imagine that. You and I have guilty, we're guilty of this. We'll read something in this newspaper down here about somebody did so and so or something, and here's our finger pointing at them. Oh, those sorry, no goods, you know what, and this. And we're pointing three right back at us who just as sorry, may not have done what that person did, or if they even did it. And we're pointing our three fingers back at our own self, in, in, in essence saying, I'm a sorry, no good something. All of our sins is on the body of Jesus. You're not so high and mighty as you think you are. If you don't know Jesus, you're a low-down, rotten sinner, and you're going to pay for it in hell. But I can tell you this, if you know Jesus, you're blessed to know that your sins have been paid for because he took them all on his own body. Just imagine whatever you're pointing your finger at and other people's sins and whatever they've done, he's got them in his own body, paying for them on that tree. 
the murderer, the whoremonger, the thief, whatever you class, they're classified as, he was that, dying for your sins and mine. Everything you ever thought, and don't tell me your mind's pure, because I can tell you you're lying if you do. We can be so angry in a split second for no reason, nearly. And think most ungodliest thought in the next second. Because we're not, we're not saved from the, the very presence of sin yet. And we're going to be. We're looking forward to that. On this old rugged cross, when Jesus is looking down, he had compassion on you. He had love for you. He has the authority to say, yeah, okay, you believe in me, you're going to heaven with me. He has that kind of a power, and he... He suffered that you might not have to suffer. He paid uh, the awful sin of uh, death and horror and agony, the Bible says. And he redeemed us. And now, as sure as he yearned to be with the Father again, he yearns for you to be with the Father. You know, I, I was told that, you know, you might, you know, be careful about weeping. I tell you, Jesus weeping over your people today the sadness in his heart for those who could be saved but reject him I'm going to ask the song leader to come I'm asking you as you will come and accept him as your savior thank God when he gave up the ghost they buried him in that old tomb three days and three nights later he arose victory over death, hell, and the grave. And that's, that gives you and me the same privilege of knowing we're, we have victory over death, hell, and the grave because of the Son of God who loved us and gave his life for us, commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. 249. The very, as we stand, we, the very first verse is your invitation to come to him accepting him and hopefully come and let us know that you have whatever reason you have you come come on